Uh, thanks very much, Akshay. So, um, yeah, so my subject is Piatic LR representations, which is an insanely rich topic. I didn't quite know where to start, but I thought I might start with some history of the subject, which, um, which for our purposes goes back to Tate. So I'm going to start with Tate. <laughs> Tate's paper on p-divisible groups. So Tate carried out, carried out argu arguably the first case of piatic Hodge theory in the context of abelian varieties. So recall that if A, that if A is an abelian variety, and let's just start off over C, and we'll switch to the piatic world shortly. If A over C is an abelian variety, um, then in particular, it's a complex torus. So it's something like some complex vector space of finite dimension modulo some lattice, and the rank of this lattice will be 2G, where G is the dimension of the abelian variety. And um, let's just work out regular Hodge theory for the abelian variety, right? So let's first look at H lower 1 of A with Z. Well, that's easy. The cycles, the one cycles, are just lambda themselves. Um, that means that H upper 1 of A with complex coefficients, so imagine taking the dual of this and then tensoring with C, so that's like Homs from lambda into C. Okay, great. Um, but the singular cohomology of a manifold is the same thing as its Durham cohomology. We have this Durham isomorphism. A, right? So what does this do? So this is calculus. This is integration, right? If you've got a differential form here, it goes to some function on the lattice here. So just take um, your element. It defines a cycle and send it to the integral. OK. Excellent. Uh, meanwhile, remember the fact that A is actually a variety. So it's Durham cohomology. Because A is a projective variety, it's a Kähler manifold, its Durham cohomology has a Hodge decomposition. So H1 Durham of A splits into the holomorphic one forms like this. And the rest is H1 of A, this coherent cohomology. Um, so basically what happens is when you take the topological thing, the H1, the singular cohomology, you tensor it with C, and the result breaks up like this, and that's what Hodge theory is for, an abelian, for H1 of an abelian variety. Okay. Um, let me just note, so I'm about to switch to piatic coefficients in a second, so what is H1 of A, Z, P? So first let me do H1 of A, Z mod P, N, Z. Okay, so that's like lambda tensor z mod p to the n. Let me rewrite that as 1 over p to the n lambda mod lambda. Okay, so the n division, the p to the n division points of lambda is like the p to the n torsion in A. So this is A p n. H lower one. H lower one. Oh, did I screw up? Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right, so H lower one of A. The ZP coefficients winds up being this object known as the Tate module. So the inverse limit of these guys over A, over N. Okay, so there's TPA. All right, so TPA shows up as the H lower one of the abelian variety. So it's true in the topological sense, but it's also true if A is an abelian variety over some field of characteristic not P, then the atala cohomology works this way too. If I just think of this thing as a dual to h upper 1 et al, then you get this, um, even in a broader context than a over a complex number. It can be over any field. OK. All right, so here's Tate's theorem. OK. So let's let k over qp be finite. Uh, and let's let a over k be an abelian variety with good reduction. Then, all right, so it's going to be the analog of the statement right here. So it's going to be about h upper 1 of a with coefficients in zp, but we know that that's just dual to the Tate module. 
So this is going to be a very interesting Galois module for, um, ah, so I should put a k, k bar here, base change to k bar first. Then the thing has an action of the Galois group of k bar over k. Um, I take this and I do the analog of tensoring with C, I tensor with CP. So let's let C be the completion of an algebraic closure of k. So this thing tensored with C breaks up in exactly the same way. So H0 of A, omega 1, A over C. Uh, well, there's a little twist. There's a Tate twist here. You have to twist by the cyclotomic character inverse. Okay, so this is an isomorphism of C vector spaces endowed with an action of Galois. So, Uh, it's a little bit tricky. So, okay, it's a little bit tricky. This is, these are, both sides are C vector spaces, and they have an action of the Galois group of k bar over k. That action, of course, doesn't respect the um, mul scalar multiplication by C. It's just semilinear. G k action. All right. All right. So, um, it's a very surprising theorem. So, I mean, this is a very rich representation of the Galois group. But somehow when I tensor it with C, it becomes something extremely simple. So this is really just, so both of these don't have an act. These vector spaces do not have an action of GK at all. They're just blank. This is just C to the G, and this is just also C to the G. So I can write this as C to the G, direct sum, C to the G minus 1, like that. Yeah. Um, excellent. So the Galois representation. Uh, Oh, I should I should explain more. Okay, all right. So I can talk about a category of C vector spaces with an action of GK. So GK acts on C. So I can talk about um, such a vector space. So I can let C be a V be a C vector space together with uh, action something like this sigma from V to V for all. Sigma inside of GK, but it's semilinear in this sense. So if I have alpha V, it has to work this way, like that. Okay. So the GK action is going to be uh, just trivial on these guys. <laughs> so it's really just CG. It's, it's just Ah, so I mean, it's just, just <laughs> is it clear? Ah, okay, I'll see what the minus one is. I, I definitely did not explain what that is. So, um, so we have one particular character of K called the cyclotomic character. So let me let chi is cyclotomic from GK to ZP star um, be the thing determined by this. So, um, Ah, so if I have some p to the nth root of unity and I hit it with an element of gk, so this has to raise it to some power, and that power shall be the cyclotomic character. Okay. And then I can define an object of this category I just described, and I'll call it c of n, so it's like c tape twisted by n. And so it's just c as a vector space, maybe I'll just E is going to be the basis element of it. And how does sigma act? So sigma acts on E by the nth power of the cyclotomic character. How's that? Good? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so as a remark, um, this theorem about the Hodge all right, yeah, I should call this thing a Hodge-Tate decomposition. Okay. Decomposition, okay. I should remark that this was generalized by faultings where A can be replaced by an arbitrary proper smooth variety over K with good reduction. Okay, so um, 
Yeah. All right, so this is sort of miraculous. Um, let me give you an example of how this might work uh, in a familiar scenario where, e, where A is an abelian, is a elliptic curve. So if E over QP has a good reduction, um, let's say good ordinary reduction. And we're interested in the Tate module of this thing. So the Tate module, which is going to be dual to the thing that the theorem applies to, um, so that's this inverse limit. So I can write it this way, EPN of ZP bar, so integral closure of ZP and QP bar. Um, so this sits in the middle of an exact sequence. So I mean the reduction of E mod P, it's P's power torsion is just a line. So I'm going to write the reduction map this way and get an exact sequence of Galois modules. So on the right-hand side, Galois acts through some unramified character. So this is one-dimensional, this is two-dimensional, or I should say rank two, rank one. And then the kernel is going to be the kernel of the reduction map, which is like the formal group of E. That's like the completion of E at its identity section. And take its state module. So each of these guys is going to be rank one. The guy in the middle is rank two. And um, you get something like this. I mean, the action of, uh, so the action of Galois on TPE tensor C um, of the action of GQP is something like this. So, um, so let's let chi just be chi cyclotomic. I don't want to write cyclotomic anymore. Uh, all right. So, oh, sorry, delta. So let's say delta is the character through which GK acts on this quotient. It's unramified because this is coming from FP bar. Um, the determinant has to be chi. I'm going to put a zero here. And then whatever the star is, is whatever that star is. Okay. So um, what is that star? So if you write out what it means for this thing to be a homomorphism from GQP into GL2, uh, you find that this star lives in a cohomology group. So it's going to be continuous cohomology, continuous cochains of GQP with values in, um, well, it's going to be like C delta, well, I kind of don't want to deal with the delta. I think it just ends up being chi like this. Okay. Ah, which is just C1. Yeah, one is the cyclotomic character. Um, and Tate proves that this is zero. So what happens is that this is potentially an interesting extension of this character by this character in the category of representations with coefficients in QP. But as soon as we tensor with C, the extension is just split. This H1 is just going to be zero. So in fact, Tate proves a more powerful theorem, which is this. So let's say eta from GQP into ZP star um, be a character which is infinitely ramified, by which I mean that the image of inertia is infinite. Then, um, well, he has control over the cohomology of this guy. So HI of GQP into su eta is going to be 0 for i equals both 0 and 1. Okay. I kind of ignored it. Should it be like delta squared or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Actually, no, yeah, might as well just write it in, right? But as far as this, or minus 2c, I didn't figure it out, so I just, <laughs> I just ignored it. But it, it, it still applies to this theorem. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. So, um, so Tate's paper is extremely beautiful, and I definitely would advise studying it. I just want to pick some highlights from some of the theorems that he proves in the service of proving his main theorem. And then I want to go towards the theory of the field of norms, which is what Gabrielle will talk about afterwards. So, um, yeah, let's start. All right, so Tate conducts this analysis of the field C essentially by breaking up into two sections. Oh, look at these. Is this the right eraser to use? Okay. 
So C uh, is the completion of K bar. And K bar over K, let's factor that tower into something like a cyclotomic part and then just the rest. So uh, I'm thinking of it this way. So, so proof involves study of a tower, k infinity over k, which is like this. So it's k bars here, k infinity is here, and k is here. And we're thinking of k infinity over k as something like the cyclotomic character. In fact, you could always think of it as a cyclotomic, character, a cyclotomic tower. Uh, um, but everything will hold as soon as we assume an axiom. Um, I want this to be Galois with group gamma, so I assume Well, I want k infinity to be a union of fields kn, where each kn is Galois over k, and it satisfies this property. When n gets big enough, the extension km plus n over km is cyclic of degree p to the n, and totally ramified. OK. OK, so that's the one axiom that we need. The example which always holds is, where for which the axiom always holds, is when you adjoin p to the nth roots of unity here. Now, for n, oh, yeah, I think. Oh, yeah. Let me just replace this M. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> ah, but then I have to change this to an M. My notes were correct. My transcription was not. Okay. Is it now right? Excellent. So K, of course, may already contain some roots of unity, but it can't contain all of them because it's a finite extension of QP. Eventually, these will start to be totally ramified over K with the right property. Okay. So that's all we need. This I'm going to replace. Okay. Um, Okay. So Tate proves a key proposition about these guys from which everything else seems to follow. It has to do with the action of the Galois group on elements of this tower. And it's like a uniformity result. So proposition. There exists an epsilon between 0 and 1, strictly, such that for all n large enough and for all g in the Galois group of kn plus 1 over kn <laughs> and for all x in O kn plus 1, g of x is congruent to x mod p to the epsilon. OK, let me stand back from this for a second. So it's a uniformity result because this epsilon doesn't depend on n. So g of x, um, well, I mean, it's not surprising that g of x should be congruent to x mod something, because after all, these extensions become totally ramified. The inertia group eventually becomes everything. So it should be congruent to x mod some power of the maximal ideal. But when you normalize everything, via, I mean, I'm just doing this like a power of p. So what does this p to the epsilon mean? It means any element of that valuation, right? So epsilon should really live in the value group of kn. But once it exists, it exists for all time. And uh, I hope the meaning of this congruence is clear. OK. Um, so the ingredients of the proof involve higher ramification groups and local class field theory. So local class field theory gives you a handle on what the abelian extensions of a piatic field are. And this extension is mostly abelian after you get to some point. It's just all a cyclic there on up. OK, so class field theory tells you what the abelian extensions of a piatic field are. On the other hand, you have a theory of um, higher ramification groups. And a detailed study of class field theory tells you how these things interact. The higher ramification groups tell you exactly about congruence of this form. So if you study this long enough, this is going to come out. OK. Um, but we can just establish it directly in the cyclotomic case. 
So if kn, if k is just qp, so if kn is qp, upn. Um, uh, no, you actually need all the towers because, yeah, because we'll, we'll say in just a second, because we're going to consider not just k infinity over k, but k bar over k infinity. So when you have a finite extension of k infinity, you get a new tower just by composing with the old tower. And then you need to apply this proposition to that tower. And the proposition, I don't think apply, I don't think, the, no, it doesn't. The proposition doesn't follow directly from the, cyclotomic case. It's quite non-trivial. Okay. So in the case of the cyclotomic character, let's just establish this directly. Uh, it suffices to satisfy the congruence for just roots of unity. So p to the n plus one root of unity. So how does it work? So what is this Galois group? So the Galois group of kn plus one over kn. Well, that's like one plus p to the n zp mod one plus p to the n plus one zp. So if, it, if I have an element g here, which corresponds to, I don't know, 1 plus p to the n a, then how does g act on a root of unity? Um, well, I'll just do it directly. Let's, if, when I subtract off 1 plus 1. OK. Um, it just multiplies it by zeta p to the power a. So that's just going to be after I factor out this guy. <clears throat> OK, I hope I did that right. Yes, after I factor out zeta p to the n plus 1. And this is congruent to p to the epsilon, where epsilon is what? So the valuation of this guy is like 1 over p minus 1. So that's our epsilon. OK. Um, right, but it works generally. So um, Tate uses propositions like this to come up with a theory of what he calls normalized traces. And normalized traces are the main tool he uses to prove this cohomological theorem like this. So that's a very beautiful story, but I also want to talk about fields of norms. So I want to take the discussion away from Tate's paper for the moment. Okay. Any questions so far? The star is zero only in the CM case? Well, maybe over QP, but remember I, I tensored everything with C. And that makes all the difference in the world. So the question is, isn't this sequence only split in the CM case? And as modules over Q, as vector spaces over QP, yes. But when you tensor with C, it's always split. So tensoring with C is this very drastic, very lossy operation. Yeah. Um, the next talk will be about operations which are not so lossy, if C is replaced by some large period ring. Yeah. Okay. What can I do next? Yeah. Um, as a corollary of this proposition, I want to talk about norms. So the norm of an element, so this, this proposition is telling you that uh, the elements of the Galois group act like the identity modulo some uniform power of P. And the norm of an element is the product of the conjugates. So the norm of an element from kn plus 1 to kn should just be like raising to the power of p, since that extension has degree p. So as a corollary of this, we get something like there exists epsilon between 0 and 1, such that for all n big enough and for all x in O kn plus 1, the norm from kn plus 1 down to kn of x is congruent to x to the p mod the same power, p to the epsilon. Since after all, this is the product of the conjugates of x, those are all, conjugate, those are all congruent to x mod p to the epsilon. OK. OK. Um, no, I want to write some big next. So that's all, that's all that goes there. Uh, uh, so the next thing to do is to define some rings in characteristic P. So um, uh, the strategy here, uh, looking at this tower, this one, is to get a good handle on this Galois group first. It turns out to be simpler than one might expect. And then later on to descend all the way down to K using the action of gamma. So the first step is just to look at this tower. All right. 
it turns out that that Galois group is the same as the Galois group of a field in characteristic P. So now I write down some fields of characteristic P. Um, so take the epsilon from the corollary and write down the following things. So it will be called E sub k with a plus and a tilde. And the problem with this Piatikoch theory is that there are so many rings and there's so much notation, but I'll try to keep it to a minimum. So it's going to be the inverse limit of OK, so the ring of integers in K infinity modulo p to the epsilon, and this inverse limit is under the Frobenius maps. Okay, since epsilon is less than one, this is a ring of characteristic p. Frobenius of p is an endomorphism of it, so it makes sense to consider the set of sequences like this, where xi to the p is xi minus one. Okay. Um, this thing is sometimes called the perfect norm field, Uh, well, without the plus, it's the perfect norm field. With the plus, oh, I've backed myself into a corner. It's the perfect norm ring. I'm just going to write field. <laughs> That's fine. Um, good. Uh, within this is the thing without the tilde. It just has the plus on it. And it's going to be a subring. You see, this, this definition only involved k infinity. It forgot the fact that k infinity was the rising union of these fields kn. If I demand that xi lands in ki, then I get a subring. So this is going to be all of the elements x inside of ek tilde plus, such that for n large enough, xn lands in OK n mod p to the epsilon. Okay. So I expect this guy up here to be quite large. And this one, I'm putting the strong demand on where the xn lies. So it will be much, much smaller. Okay. Uh, even though I just said it's quite large, it's not totally obvious that it has any elements at all. Um, I mean, the one obvious thing is that it is a ring, because it's an inverse limit of rings under endomorphisms. That's fine. Um, it is of characteristic p, because p is 0 in, in this ring. <laughs> That's all. Uh, it does contain a field. So it definitely contains the residue field of k infinity. All right, so I'll talk about residue fields for a second. I have to make up some notation for them. If I let k sub n, lowercase k sub n, be the residue field of capital Kn, uh, then I can let k infinity be the union of these guys. But you know, the Kn's are ramified when n is large enough, so eventually these fields will stabilize. Okay, fine. And then it's pretty clear to see that k infinity, lowercase k infinity, is contained inside of this ring and therefore this one. So it's actually contained in OKN mod p to the epsilon. So k sub n is contained inside of OK, oops, KN mod p to the epsilon via the Teichmuller lift. So once you observe that, uh, and you observe that Kn is a perfect field, then you could come up with elements of Ek plus quite easily. So you find that, at the very least, K infinity is contained inside of this field Ek plus. Sorry, inside of this ring Ek plus. So it's a ring of characteristic P. It contains this perfect field K infinity. Does it contain anything else? So at least in the cyclotomic case, we can come up with non-trivial elements which don't belong to this perfect field. Mm. 
Yeah, so I'm um, right. So in fact, you can talk about the Teichmuller lift even without modding by p to the epsilon, but then you won't get a ring homomorphism. So what it is is you, um, yeah, I guess the quickest way to say it is that if you have an element of Kn, Kn's a field. If it's non-zero, it's some root of unity in that field. And you, there's a unique root of unity in OKn. Whose reduction is that? So send it to that one. And then you've just got to check that this is actually a ring homomorphism. In fact, it's a ring homomorphism when you mod out by P. Okay. Um, yeah. So, okay. In the case, right. So in the cyclotomic case, where Kn is just a Qp mu P to the N, um, Ek plus contains an element which I'll call epsilon. And epsilon is, yeah, I mean, given what these fields are, it's pretty obvious what to do. All right, so you take the image of each root of unity in Okn mod p to the epsilon, where epsilon is our, you see, you know, 1 over p minus 1. And these are compatible under the action of Frobenius, right? So I mean, x to the p takes this guy to this guy. So this is definitely an element inside of k plus. Okay. Um, and it's not contained in lowercase k infinity, which is just fp. I mean, after all, it's not even finite order. It's not equal to 0. And there's no power you could raise this to to get 1. Uh, in fact, epsilon minus 1, if you look at this, you get 0 zeta p minus 1, zeta p squared minus 1. Uh, now, each of these elements is a uniformizer in its respective field. So these guys are all uniformizers. Um, and as a result, well, I didn't say it, but this OEK plus, well, both of these rings are topological rings. This ring is discrete, but when I take this inverse limit of a bunch of discrete rings, it does have a topology. How do I know when a sequence is going to zero? Sorry, it would be a sequence of sequences. How do I know when a sequence of sequences is going to zero? Well, eventually you get zeros in the first guy, the second guy, the third guy, and on and so forth. And then it's plain to see that when you take this element, why don't I call it t, and I take powers of it, um, when I take the p minus first power of it, this goes to zero. When I take the p times p minus first power of it, this is zero. So this guy is topologically null potent. So I've come up with a, an element t inside of ek plus in the cyclotomic case. And um, since I've kind of done things for the uniformizers, and since every element of OKN is like a power series in the uniformizer of that field, you kind of get everything in terms of t. So it's easy to, easy to check that, that, well, a priori we have fp living inside of e plus k. Um, t lives there too, so we have a map like that. And then since t is topologically nilpotent, it extends to a map like this. And it's easy to check that this is an isomorphism. So in the cyclotomic case, Ek plus is just a power series ring in one variable over Fp. Okay. So this very functorial construction got us something quite simple out of something quite complicated. And actually, it works this way in general, no matter what the tower is. So, so proposition. So I just want to mimic what was going on here. We had a uniformizer here. And I was able to come up with a pth root of it modulo p. And it turns out you can always do this. So if n is large enough, uh, so we're in the general case now, not just the cyclotomic case. If n is large enough, and if pi n in OK n is a uniformizer, a unif, 
then there exists a uniformizer pi n plus 1 and OK n plus 1, such that pi n plus 1 to the p is congruent to pi n mod p to the epsilon. Okay. So this is kind of a crucial proposition. It allows us to extract p roots modulo p to the epsilon, and thereby come up with non-trivial elements inside of ek plus. All right, so this will be the one thing that I offer a proof for. Uh, but, and that proof will just be a sketch. So it'll be an algorithm to compute what this pi n plus 1 is. Uh, I'm looking, so pi n plus 1 is going to end up being a uniformizer. It's, that's going to be forced by, by the situation. You know what its valuation is, as long as n is large enough. Um, so let me let some other element, I don't know, var pi n plus 1 be an OK n plus 1. Let this be some uni uniformizer. Yeah. And we know that the norm of this guy from kn plus, I'm gonna, I don't want to write it, but that's the norm from kn plus 1 down to kn. This thing lives inside of OKn, and it is a uniformizer. It has the right valuation. So, oh, and n is large enough so that this is totally ramified. So this is going to be a uniformizer. For kn. Um, and therefore, it can be written as some power series in pi n, which is our given uniformizer. So as a power series like this, 1 to infinity, of Teichmuller representative of ai times pi n to the i, where, uh, no, yeah, pi n to the i, that's right, where ai's live in kn. Okay. okay, so I've written the thing as a power series in pi to the n, pi n. Um, and what we want to do is find the correct uniformizer, this pi, regular pi n plus 1, Uh, and all we know is that it's going to have to be some power series in the uniformizer that we have. Great. Um, and this has to satisfy the congruence over there. So it's a situation of given the A's, solve for the B's. All right, we want to find this power series here such that oh. <laughs> so that um, pi to the n plus 1 to the p is congruent to pi n mod p to the epsilon. Okay. Um, but, this, but this thing on the left, I mean, it's this... Um, power series, I can just raise everything to the p, modulo p to the epsilon. Mm -hmm. And now I take this uh, var pi n plus 1 to the p, and I apply that very important corollary up here. So now it's time to apply a Tate's, Tate's theorem here. So for the Frobenius, so modulo p to the epsilon is congruent to the norm. So I can just plug that in here. This is the norm of var pi n plus 1 to the power of i. And this I have an expression for. It's right here. You take this power series and you plug it into this one. And you set it equal to pi n. And you get an infinite collection of, of equations to solve for in the BIs. And it turns out that you can do it by induction. So, so solve, solve for the BIs. OK. All right, so after that, thank you. <laughs> so after that crucial lemma. So this shows that you can construct elements in this ring E plus K. This bigger one. Uh, 
Uh, actually, let's start here. Uh -huh. So in fact, E plus K, this funny ring of characteristic P, just winds up being a power series also, a power series ring also. So let's let uh, 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 the typical thing to do is to let pi bar. The bar indicates that we're in characteristic p. So it's going to be an element um, dot 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 pi n pi n plus one dot dot dot, and this is supposed to live inside of a e k plus, where the pi n's are uniformizers for n large enough. I don't care what happens. I mean, they might not be past some point here, but I don't care. Remember that EK plus was defined to be sequences like this, which are Frobenius compatible, such that the nth term lies in KN for N large enough. So I want, starting from some N, these all should be uniformizers. Um, then it turns out that EK plus is merely a power series ring in one variable over its residue field. So this X here corresponds to pi bar. Okay. So the field of norms, the imperfect field of norms, is just a Laurent series ring in one variable. Um, maybe this is a good time to mention that without the, I mean, now that we know the thing is a domain, it makes sense to say, like, okay, let's let EK be its fraction field. So let's just do that. Okay. <laughs> so the plus is indicating bounded elements or integral elements. Without the plus, you invert a uniformizer. B, well, I also have this thing EK tilde. And it turns out it's not so hard, given part A, that EK tilde is just going to be, well, it's going to be a perfect ring and it's going to be complete, and it's just the completion of the perfection of this guy. So this is written as k infinity power series in x, one on p infinity. Okay. So it's like power series in x where you allow arbitrary p power roots of x, but they still have to converge. That is, the powers of x, if you write the thing as a power series, the exponents that you see below 100, there's only finitely many of them. And below 1,000, there's only finitely many of them, and so forth. Okay. Okay. Great. All right, so we have some passage from. How is EK tilde defined? Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, I, I forgot a plus, didn't I? Yeah, I did. But, but I did that. And. Now I answer your question. <laughs> so once again, it's the fraction field. So it's going to be k infinity Laurent series and one p infinity. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So I've given you this process for turning a tower of piatic fields into a single field of characteristic P. And I do need to go over what happens when you try to go in the reverse direction. How do you, starting from the field of characteristic P, how do you recover the characteristic zero field? Like, does it remember, does EK remember the field K infinity? So when we want to pass from characteristic P to characteristic zero, that's when vit vectors get involved. You could take um, the vit vectors of a ring in characteristic P and get something in characteristic zero, but that only really works well when the thing you start with is perfect. So I would only want to take vit vectors of a perfect ring. So let's just focus on the perfect field of norms right here. So um, uh, one thing I can tell you is that we have a map. So this map is usually denoted theta from the vit vectors of ek tilde plus to the ring of integers in o k infinity hat. Okay. So this is this going in the other direction. 
Um, to define a map from vit vectors of something to something else, I have to tell you where the Teichmuller representatives go. So if I have an x here, um, this has to go somewhere here. Um, x, what is x? x belongs to ek tilde plus, and that's a sequence. Elements of that are sequences like so. Um, each one lives in ok infinity modulo p to the epsilon, but let me just lift them. So these shall be representatives inside of OK infinity for these guys, because those guys lived in, I should just remind you that they lived in OK infinity mod p to the epsilon. So just live, lift them haphazardly. Uh, what do I get over here? Well, it's some limit. It's some analytic thing. So it's the limit as n goes to infinity of xn tilde to the p to the n. All right, well, there's the formula here. So there's some analytic map from the vit vectors of the field of norms, the perfect field of norms, to the ring of integers of the completion of k infinity. So that's how you go in the opposite direction. Um, it turns out, I mean, a priori, this only seems like it should be multiplicative, but it turns out it respects the addition law as well. Um, it is surjective. Sorry. Yes, and uh, say. okay. What is the kernel? That's all I have to say. Okay. Um, I have to give you an element of the kernel. All I want to say is that the kernel is principal. It's generated by an element omega. And I'll tell you what omega is uh, in this cyclotomic case. So in cyclotomic case, well, remember we had this element epsilon, which lived inside of ek. Okay. All right, so what's theta of epsilon? Well, according to this formulation, if you follow the recipe through, I've got to lift these guys to OK infinity. Well, why don't I just use 1, zeta p, zeta p squared, and so forth, and then run it through this limit, and every element in that limit is just 1, so I just get 1. Okay. So it's easy to come up with an element of the kernel, namely Teichmuller representative epsilon minus 1. But it turns out that doesn't generate the whole kernel because I can give you an element here. So epsilon to the 1 over p, imagine this sequence where everything, everything is shifted over to the left by 1. When I run it through the same process, I get zeta p. And now I can write down omega for you. It's the following thing. It's epsilon minus 1 over epsilon to the 1 on p minus 1. So first of all, this divides this because of geometric series. And theta of it equals 1, because theta of the numerator is 0. Uh, sorry, theta of it is 0, uh, because the numerator is 0, and the denominator is not. Okay. So this omega is what generates the kernel. Okay. Right. Um, and then, ah, great. So we can now give a description of the Galois group of k infinity using the ring of norms, the field of norms. So I want to indicate to you how to do this process of taking the field of norms in a relative setting. So if, let's say we're given a finite extension m over k infinity. So if, if this is a finite extension, then, um, well, you know, it, it's, it, it's obtained by adjoining some element, and that element is algebraic over some kn. So you can really just write this thing as a union of MNs. Um, oh, I can actually, well, I can do you one better, where let's say MN is something like M naught times KN for N large enough. Like that, right? So if M is obtained by joining some element, like let's say that element lies in M naught, 
um, it's algebraic over kn. And then for every n bigger than that one, you can define this field, and then m will be this, this union. And then this mn's, uh, they satisfy the same axiom that the kn's did, so that the mn's are a tower of the same sort that the kn's were. So you can apply this whole theory to it and get a field of norms, em. Uh, and this is going to be a finite extension of ek. Okay. So I've defined some way of passing from finite extensions of k infinity to finite extensions of ek. Um, what is also true is that it is a separable extension, which is something you have to watch out for in characteristic p. So EK, remember, was just a power series ring. So it's just like K infinity Laurent series in one variable like this. Okay, a lot simpler. And this fact, this coincidence that the field of norms is just a Laurent series ring is the basis for a lot of constructions in piatic Hodge theory, notably the phi gamma module, which Gabrielle will talk about. Okay, so I just want to draw one more picture here. It turns out you can go the other way. I want to assemble all of the various bijections into one diagram. Hmm. So, uh, all right, so this is some form of a theorem proved by Fontaine and Benton Berger. There exists, there exist equivalences among the following four categories. <laughs> the first is the objects we were interested in. So finite extensions of k infinity. And this was important because I wanted to study the Galois group of k bar over k. I split that study into the Galois group of k bar over k infinity. And then I will later descend to k via the action of the Galois group of k bar over k. But for now, this is about the finite extensions of k infinity. Okay. All right. The, main, the, mo the most interesting part is this top row of the diagram. So here it's finite extensions of ek. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, down here, so the bottom row is going to be completions. So here I put finite extensions, finite separable extensions <laughs> of EK tilde. And here I put finite extensions of k infinity hat. So remember that in this infinite extension, k infinity, it's not complete. I have to complete it to get something complete. And I can make an arrow this way by taking a finite extension of k infinity and completing it. <laughs> and I can go in the reverse direction too. I mean, if I have some extension of the completion, you can approximate it by some finite extension of one of the layers of the tower kns. Okay. Um, this Arrow is going to be M goes to EM. This arrow is going to take an extension of EK. I mean, remember that EK tilde was the completed perfection of EK. You would join all pth roots of all elements, and then you complete. So do the same thing to the objects of these categories. Um, so I've explained every arrow except this one, so I'll explain the arrow going in this direction. All right, so what does that do? It takes L. <laughs> and well, I, now I need to get something in characteristic 0. I have something in characteristic P. I need to get something in characteristic 0. I'll use vit vectors. So I'll take the vit vectors of OL. Um, that's an algebra over the vit vectors of EK tilde plus. And we've also seen that there's a map from this guy to k infinity hat. 
namely this theta map. And that's my map in the other direction. Okay. So in other words, this is just vit vectors of OL adjoin 1 over P mod up by this element omega that I talked to you about, because omega is the kernel of this map. Okay. Right. Um, so as a little corollary of this, Okay, so if finite extensions of, G, of, K, of K infinity are the same as finite acceptable extensions of EK, then two Galois groups are isomorphic. So the Galois group of K infinity is isomorphic to the Galois group of EK, which was just a power series ring in one variable over a perfect field. So that's the virtue of working with these highly ramified extensions. Things become a bit simpler when you go to the top. You pass to the field of norms, then you're in characteristic P, and we have this. The last thing I'll say has to do indicate how you might descend this picture from K infinity to K. So, all right, so the picture was like this. You've got K, K infinity, and K bar. And the Galois group of k infinity over k, let me call it just gamma. And remember that gamma, so gamma is going to be this profinite group with zp as an open subgroup. Or if you like, you can just think of it as zp. So, um, so this gamma acts on all of the objects that we've, const we've constructed. So this thing acts on, in particular, it acts on ek, this perfect norm field, which was isomorphic to k infinity Laurent series in X. In the cyclotomic case, you had gamma being like ZP star. And if an element A here corresponds to gamma A, it would be nice to make precise what this action is. So gamma A acts on X by the following important formula. If you trace the whole construction, where this x represents roots of unity minus 1, how does gamma a act on it? Well, you'd better add 1 back to get a root of unity, then hit it with the automorphism, which is just like raising to the a, and then subtract 1. So this is the formula. And so this is the formula uh, for the action of gamma in the context of phi gamma modules, which we'll talk about soon. I, okay, so why don't I stop there?